Okay, so uh, now we're going to have our um, uh, plenary session from uh, CA Healthcare. It is being live streamed again, so it's uh, bit.ly slash sg17 live. Um, Dr. Crawford um, uh, has been our singles president now for, uh, I think, around three years, three years or so. Two going on three. Two going on three. So he's traveled with us uh, around the world to be able to help to build affiliations, uh, support the international community, uh, further the development of, of uh, research and republications, uh, working with an axle, as well as the um, editing a, a new book by Singos uh, for us um, uh, in, in progress right now. And so Scott's been a phenomenal volunteer for the organization and has given really countless hours uh, to the group. So we're very appreciative of, of his continued support and very excited to be sharing the CAE Healthcare uh, sponsored talk today uh, as a little sponsor. So thank you so much, Scott. slides. I know it's a little bit bright in here, so hopefully this is a good compromise. Um, again, thank you. It's uh, actually a great honor to be able to work with this organization and with all of you amazing, innovative people. Um, and just to uh, kind of let you know a little bit about myself as well, I also am 5'8". <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I started with the presentation, uh, but for, uh, for you know, full disclosure here, I, I don't have any financial relationship with any of the, the products or items that I'm discussing. And as I mentioned, I'm a volunteer with the organization and have been since it started um, when I started attending five years ago. So um, I'm here because I love it, because I'm passionate about it, and because I know what it's capable of doing as we move forward. Because you have a <laughs> For this talk, I do actually hope that you'll be able to take away a few um, important pieces, and one of those is that you understand the, the full scope of what we are capable of within simulation operations and the technology available to us. I want you to be able to describe what some of those innovative technologies are and how we can best integrate them into our practice in some way. And then identify how this set of innovations is actually impacting global healthcare and education on a larger scale moving forward. So we're going to start a little bit with operations and you heard a bit about the standards from an axle yesterday and it's a, a great um, condensed set of uh, rules, regulations, not so much, guidelines basically for how to proceed forward if you're new to it, if you don't know what you're doing, and to make it consistent for delivery of, of healthcare education in simulation. We talked about starting to build some of the standard for simulation operations and the sim tech role within that, which currently is not well addressed by any of the literature. So that work four years ago is hopefully now getting closer to actually having something tangible and I'm going to describe some of the work we did with that. But we broke down operations a little bit further to help understand what we actually do so that we can put it into a standard, which if you think about your daily work for many of you, is not standard in any way. <laughs> so operations addresses the needs and logistics of all of the medical educators. It is about the people, the processes, and the infrastructure required to be able to appropriately conduct healthcare education in a simulated environment. So, well, isn't it just tech? Well, no, it's more than tech. So education is, of course, the end goal. Patient safety is part of that education, but you need certain things to be able to support that education. And some of those are administration, coordination, and then the specialty skills 
whether it's audio video design, whether it's information technology, whether it's moulage skill, whether it's your ability to debrief or facilitate a scenario. Those are all part of that specialist piece that is not well characterized. But understanding that that administration and coordination component is also part of your job on a daily basis, I don't think has been well understood by many centers and by many administrative personnel. And so showing that this necessary support structure, whether you're in a center with a single person that does all of this, or you're fortunate enough to have a large department that has four people for each one of these roles, every piece of this has to exist in your center to be functional. And this document will be able to support that claim with evidence-based research to show why it's necessary. So again, can't get into all the specific details, but kind of give you an overview. It needs to be a common vision. So this may start as simply as a mission statement, a vision statement, so that your program knows what it is trying to accomplish. Are you there to support the needs of the medical school and the delivery of education to the learners? Or, like this center here, are you here to support an entire regional healthcare system and understand systems and processes? No one of those is correct or incorrect, but it is what the purpose and drive for your center should be. And unless you have that enumerated and you have a common goal and an understanding of everybody that's employed and working for that goal, you're going to have people straying off from the expected plan. And this is going to come from leadership and administration and whether that is you helping to make those decisions, whether it's somebody else, they need to know this so that they can start to push for it. Personnel requirements. We'd like to think that everybody, you can just pull them straight off the shelf and fit them into any role you want and they'll just fit happily in there. And, but that's not the case. Everybody's different. Then they need to be different. They all have a special skill, a special niche. And that's why we're trying to find them. So we talk about everybody coming from a different background. And some of the earlier discussions five years ago when I started attending conferences like this, oh, what is the ideal background? Should I be, should I be pulling people in from information technology and trying to you know, train them up on healthcare? Or you know, we need to be getting that nurse educator and we can teach them how to use all of the, the audio video stuff. Or, well, you know, maybe we should be getting just engineers and let them just design and create everything that we're looking for. There isn't one person that's going to do this. There isn't one person, there isn't one skill set, one background. The fact that all of us has, have come from a different background is what is making this a dynamic and powerful specialty to be pursuing. Next piece that needs to be addressed is space, storage, resources. When we're putting together centers, everybody tries to figure out how many rooms can we fit in. And our question is always, well, how can we fit our stuff that isn't in the rooms? Because there's more of that than there is actual learning space on any given day. We are a dynamic industry and we have to be able to train everything from robotic surgery to neonatal resuscitation to coping and communication skills. And every tool is different for each of those tasks. So often storage is a hindsight picture for centers after they've got themselves built. They walk in and, oh, well, you didn't tell me you needed a different mannequin for this room. I thought it was just going to be on the bed the whole time. So making sure that those types of thoughts are in place up front and that there is an expectation that when planning operations and when planning center design and development, that storage is a consideration up front and specifically enumerated. Keep in mind that it's not just the availability and where to stash it, but that there has to be a coordinated system for use and utilization. And you are the specialists that will determine what that should be. When an educator comes in and says, I need to be running the best, highest fidelity, most impressive equipment that you have to deliver my simulation, you need to be empowered, just as anybody in the healthcare system, to feel free to stand up and say, why? 
what are you trying to deliver with your healthcare goals, your educational message? And only after that discussion should this group be involved in the use of equipment to match that educational need. But there needs to be a pairing and the ability to schedule and have appropriate availability and use for all equipment is going to make healthcare simulation more affordable and more effective. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to finance. You have to be able to keep this in a sustainable environment. Healthcare simulation is expensive. The equipment is expensive. Your time is expensive. The educator's time is expensive. The center's time is expensive. Yes, it's no comparison to human life, to human suffering, but we still have to be responsible about how we use and implement this training and this technology. So as we move forward, we need to have a system that addresses what the cost-effective delivery should be. You've all been listening to talks over the last day or two about how to more effectively deliver healthcare education by tweaking something about how it's done, by improving upon something that some company has already created. Now that's not to say that corporate design products aren't appropriate or effective, but they may not be appropriate or effective for every learner. And that's where your innovations are able to take shape. So, systems integration. This photo here was before I got interested in medicine. I was beginning to pursue a career in physics. I got the amazing opportunity to work at the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And when I got assigned there, they said, you will be working on the new particle accelerator. And I said, oh. <laughs> Funny, I didn't have a class on that yet. <laughs> And so this is the first 10 feet of a several mile long particle accelerator that they were beginning to build in 1999 to 2000. I'm sure it's up and running now. I haven't checked back to see what all happened to it. <coughs> the part I was in charge of was about this big. So you need to have systems integration. Remember that you are not working in a silo when you are delivering healthcare education in a simulation center. That nurse, that physician, that specialist, that tech, that pharmacist is going to be going and delivering healthcare to a larger organization and a larger regional need. So where does your delivery of healthcare education fit in that larger need? And has somebody at your center considered how you impact that larger regional, national, or international healthcare delivery? But if you don't have a system for, we are addressing this need for this group, education is great, but it should be directed to fit a need. And so the systems integration component of this is how you address that need. So just kind of to help summarize this, you are specialists. You are, speci you are specialists in logistic supervision, cost containment, data collection to help drive change and need within your center, personnel coordination to ensure that you have the correct educators, staffing, and equipment resources at any given location at any given time to deliver effective care for as many groups as possible. That you will help make modality selections that will help the educator deliver more effective care because they don't have the time and shouldn't be expected to be an expert in how to use every piece of equipment in the simulation center. They have to be staying up on what the current trends are, how you deliver the healthcare, and how you actually practice safe care. But simulation and the use of the equipment has become its own specialty, and they need help and should ask for help in how to best utilize it. You may see problems and become innovators. And I encourage you to find problems 
and become innovators. The problems will find you, but you have to respond to fixing them. And finally, integration. Again, without putting this into a larger context, you're not going to be as effective in the healthcare delivery and healthcare education that you can provide. Simulation is still progressing forward. Now, this is the technology acceptance model. Is anybody familiar with this? Has anybody heard about this? Got a, a nod, show of hands up here. So this was a, a bit of a new concept for me, but it's been around for several decades now, looking at what are the factors that affect whether technology goes from, hey, that's really cool, to actual implementation and use. So what's a good example of a technology that kind of went forward and within just a few years was so easy, had such great perceived utility and such great actual utility that it took off instantly? Here's my example. Who took Uber on some portion of their transportation to or from this conference? It's about a third of the room. Okay. Now this has been applied to other technologies and other systems to figure out what those features are. And I'm going to point out one amusing point of this one. So this is specifically looking at that perceived usefulness, that perceived ease of use, how it affects attitude and the actual intention and ability to use. So this was looking at Physicians specifically, a lot of these have looked at integration in business or uh, <coughs> other industries, but very few have looked at physician specific implementation. And a lot of what our educators would look like is from this group. So that's why I like this study. And you'll notice that perceived ease of use down there, 0 0.08, just so you know, the highest you could get here would be one. That's really small, that the impact of perceived ease of use of 0 0.08 and 0 0.1 means that there is almost no impact of that consideration towards a physician-applied model, this specifically being for telemedicine adaptation. So is it easy to use? The physician didn't care. Now, you might think, well, that's just because they believe that they're good enough that they won't have any problems with any of the technology and how it's used, right? Or is it because they have an entire team of people at their beck and call to be able to fix any of those problems that that is no longer part of their consideration? So when we're considering the technology acceptance model within simulation, we need to remember that that consideration is often not there because this room exists and we make it possible. But they don't always consider that to be the reason. So as you begin to find these new technologies and these new innovations, you'll find that you'll be able to find uses and fix problems, as I've been describing. And I'm going to go through and show just some examples of how you might be able to get some of those, uh, to implement some of those changes. So a lot of people have seen the 3D printer at the front of the room and wonder, well, that's great, but how am I going to do that? What am I actually going to fix with it? Once you start to understand how it can be used, the doors for how you will use it will open up. Now you saw the model for the trachea that was designed by the uh, winning group from the, the hackathon. A phenomenally simple model and in the span of a few hours they were able to kind of cut and maneuver pieces, sort of sculpting in digital space and then producing a prototype. If something wasn't correct about it, you could go back to the model, adjust a little bit of it and try again. So rapid prototyping and design allows you to trial and error things in the matter of minutes to hours, whereas previously something like that could have taken days to weeks to send off and get a part back. So that is where the implementation of this is the most effective. I had a need to train priapism reduction as an educator. 
Anybody know what priapism is? Would you explain it to the person next to you? <laughs> so, you may have seen commercials for certain medications that say if you have a, uh, an uncomfortable condition lasting longer than four hours, uh, to, uh, to seek medical attention. Well, on more than one occasion, I have watched resident physicians in practice not to do the watch one, do one, teach one, but just skip those first two completely. <laughs> because they are the senior person on, having never seen it, having never watched it, and are now actually not only expected to do it, but to be instructing at the same time. <clears throat> so how do you train a skill like this that happens maybe once or twice a year in an emergency department with 60,000 visits. But you still need to know how to do it when it comes in. I've talked with vendor companies. I said, this is what I need. I need a task trainer that has these features. <coughs> the problem is, because it only happens once or twice a year, it's not a big enough market to pursue as a commercializable product. This is still a need for education in the community, but isn't going to be addressed immediately by a large corporate vendor. So this is where your innovation and your idea or your ability to work with your clinicians is going to be able to pay off. The whole 3D design ended up being what I'm holding in my hand there. It's about the size of a milk cap. Looks like a biohazard symbol. It just has cutouts on either side so that the balloons from the dollar store could be filled with blood, put inside, and then wrapped through the notches that were included on that model. One of those is assembled at either end of those balloons and a piece of foam rubber out of an old couch cushion is placed underneath. A condom slid over the top of it and it became a functional task trainer that allowed palpation, instruction of nerve injection, and aspiration of real blood with loss of turgor to show that you had resolution of symptoms. This was pennies to create and allowed me to train 36 residents so that next time they go in for a urologic procedure, they know how to deliver anesthetic care and appropriate delivery of treatment. Most of the urologists in training have a similar problem with this, that their first occurrence is on a live patient. So keep in mind how each of these technologies works, what you can do with it, and you'll figure out how you can advance it forward. We talked about this yesterday in great detail with that amazing plenary talking about augmented and virtual reality and working in groups about how we would innovate and design something to fix a problem for the future. I had the great fortune to run into a graphic artist started as paper and pen and video game design. Started working for Raytheon in their 3D modeling and simulation department and then stepped away from the defense industry looking for another uh, use for his skill set. Right now he is making augmented reality add-ons so you can walk up to community art exhibits with your iPod, hold it up, and it will give you the story of the artist that made the drawing, it will tell you a little bit about it, and it will add 3D animation on top of the graphic in front of you. And I saw this and I said, I've got another way you can go with this. Just working with him as a volunteer, he was so amazed with the possibilities of where this technology could go in healthcare education that he's developed four modules for me. A beating heart, a video demonstration of a neurovascular bundle and nerve depolarization cell. He's embedded, just like Harry Potter, a video inside of a textbook so that when you bring your phone iPod, iPad, camera in front of it, a video starts playing right inside of the textbook that you're reading. 
this technology, when you understand what it can do and how it can be applied to healthcare education, will allow you to build curriculum that has never been possible before. What you see behind me there is an operating room that he created just to showcase how this technology could be used for the president of the university, who did not understand what the capabilities were. So we're now looking at better ways of uh, partnering and collaborating, but these people may exist in your community already and be able to meet a specific need. So rather than becoming a consumer of the technology coming in, we're hoping to be able to become a producer of the innovation that can be used around the world. So this example of virtual reality, and remember quick, virtual reality is everything you see or experience is computer generated. The only real environment that you impact is the ground you are standing on. And as we saw yesterday, yet that may not even be true for a whole lot longer. Augmented reality is the ability to overlay or add computer-generated images on top of existing space and equipment. So you'll hear, see here the image of the textbook in the background with now this floating skull above it. And the way that these work is the augmented reality image is a key. So it knows what perspective and orientation you're in. So not only can you hold it and see something, you can now walk around it and see all sides just as you would in real life moving around that object suspended in space in front of you. This is amazing technology and still right now in the realm of education and entertainment is working to merge together but will change the way that we um, absorb three-dimensional information. It looks kind of funny up here because there's not a good way to display it otherwise. But 3D video that you experience inside of a virtual reality headset, whether it's a Google Cardboard, whether it's an Oculus, whether it's your phone, whatever it is, is shot in equirectangular video. So this is the concept that you have a 360 degree video shot all at the same time on 180 degrees of vertical. Any location that you move, the uh, accelerometer and direction sensors inside of that device will give you a clear view as though you had been looking there the entire time. So how can this be used in healthcare education? For our medical students in their fourth year, about to become doctors, they are not allowed to step into the room during a level one trauma. So that when you graduate as a physician, you have never been allowed past the curtain. How are you going to be an effective intern, an effective care provider in that environment? The rationale is that the room is too crowded, too busy, there's too much stuff and they can't have any additional bodies in there. Well, we need to find a way of solving that. So, can you suspend an equirectangular video camera from the center of the room over the patient's bed? and record that environment so that every learner in the class can experience it at the same time. Can we use that to figure out where an experienced attending physician knows to look at the monitor to watch the nurse putting in the IV to pay attention to the resident doing the procedure since everything in that room is all happening at the same time and you can only see this much of it at any, any given moment. Do you know where to focus your attention? we can now recreate that environment over and over again for teaching and training purposes. The camera systems to be able to implement something like this is as simple as six GoPro cameras assembled into a 3D printed frame. All of the images are put out into software that will take care of this aspect ratio adjustment for you. But the way that this camera format works is it is essentially recording the six frames of the inside of a cube and stitching them together so that the headset knows how to interpret the image barriers between them. Even outside of the advanced technologies, augmented virtual reality, equirectangular videos, and virtual reality headsets, simple things that we do 
can help draw and engage people into the scenario quite a bit more. Many of you have attended the workshops on moulage, but when you walk in and see this patient in front of you, you're no longer asking, so what do I see? Is this, what, you said this was a burn patient, but I don't understand. That's no longer a question for this patient. You immediately go and begin treatment and focus on this area. But you have to have somebody with the skill set to use silicone, to use makeup, and then to be able to reproduce and move this equipment around. This is another specialized skill and technology that you are becoming experts in. But remember, all of this has to go back to one feature. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's technology that enhances and delivers a need within healthcare education. You have to, at every step of the way during scenario design and development, marry your objective with the tools and techniques that you're using in that training environment. But that includes staging and scripting. That includes your ability to design the flow and function of the scenario so that every person in that room and when they enter that room affects the, uh, the function of the clinician, of the student involved in the scenario. This is a photo from a disaster scenario that was run. The patient in the bed, who's pregnant and part of a mass casualty blast injury with radiation in her arm that is being uh, scanned with a Geiger counter. The room is already chaotic and beginning to work with that. And at five minutes into the case, a second gurney is pushed into the room with a child with an organophosphate poisoning that was her son from the same incident. So there is no longer room to move around the room as they used to. They have to figure out how to communicate and pass equipment now while delivering effective care. You can see how crowded it is here at the head of the bed. There isn't even enough room to fit two people to pass from one side of the bed to the other. Group from the uh, hackathon working on pulmonary edema didn't want to get too involved with that particular discussion, it was used in this case. We had built our own device for that exact purpose because we found that need. Underneath this bed, there's an aquarium pump. It's fed into a bottle that has two stoppers in the top, just like the plunger that they were designing to go into their lung. One tube ran air into a soap and water mixture. The second tube ran up a hole drilled through the side of the mannequin and in through the lung, just as they were designing, fed foam straight out of the tube and the airway in this mannequin at a rate so great that they could not effectively perform intubation without having two suction devices. And it was controlled with a wireless key fob so that we could turn it on and off as they had delivered the appropriate amount of atropine into the patient. So knowing how to design, stage, and script a scenario will help deliver more effective communication by your learners and make them understand the realism and impact of disaster scenarios and the treatment <coughs> options that they can provide. There was an excellent talk yesterday on chest tube models and chest tube design. The need is that you have expensive skins, you're trying to run hundreds of learners through a session in a year, and the equipment itself is large and bulky. Same problems I encountered at my center and began developing this chest tube training model. It is a piece of plywood and two by six upright with a groove cut on each side. You'll notice I left it on there intentionally final rib there has a little bit of marking on it. Does anybody recognize it? It's three quarter inch PVC pipe sold in 10 foot lengths for $1.50 at Home Depot. You run it through a band saw on edge twice and you end up with quarter round that looks exactly like a rib and is flexible. 
it's bent and folded and glued into place at the width of a rib. And I now have a device that fits inside of a one foot cube, costs $6 to manufacture, and specialty foam companies will laser cut and send adhesive backed foam in different densities of silicone and polyurethane rubber that can be adhered to this surface. It has a realistic skin cut. You actually have to dissect through adipose tissue, something that doesn't yet exist on the commercial products. And I've shown it to 10 training sites across the country with multiple learners, including 80 individuals from the air flight crew in our region. And every single one of them applauds the plural pop that you get as you go through that thickest layer of silicone. No, I am not going to be training anatomic placement of a chest tube on this model. But as soon as they can point to a torso anywhere in the room on any mannequin or model of where they're going to place that tube, they're going to place a sterile field on here and suddenly everything looks exactly the same as it would on a real mannequin. So this was how we were able to effectively utilize silicone rubbers that I had seen as replacement pieces for torsos and other things and found the source of them to be able to fit this, ne uh, this necessity. The gentleman I work with in our office uses the Arduino. He's used it to design this as a prototype that he's now putting out for patent. It is a wearable pulse generator so that your standardized patients have a palpable pulse that can be adjusted in terms of rate, regularity, and it can be placed on a wrist, neck, or any other site. It uses cell phone speakers adjusted wirelessly through an Arduino board for control. And the pulse on that speaker is now detectable by the, uh, the pads on your fingers. So knowing how to use the equipment and what the capabilities of the technology are will make you a more effective innovator. Biggest limitation of the VR environment right now is your ability to interact with it in a realistic, tactile manner. Ultra Haptics. This company here just received a grant for eight, just shy of 18 million pounds because they believe that they have figured out a method to deliver haptic feedback without gloves that could be so, I, and I wish I understood the technology, but their claim is that it is so um, effective and able to differentiate different textures without gloves that you could actually have wind, air, and light touch as part of this. Now imagine without being strapped to equipment like this, being able to interact with those butterflies or those bubbles and get feedback from them. We've now crossed the barrier of training in surgical and procedural devices from ever needing task trainers. So, um, I was at a different conference, but not from my field, and they had the demo of that. And you can, you can put on a VR, and they had a ball and a square, and the pad, and it's they, they explained it, it's air. And you can feel the edges of the square, like perfectly. And you can drop the ball, that was their, their prototype, and then you can, you can feel it bounce and go back in your hand. It, it was, it was uh, amazing. And they explained that the reason why you feel it is that they have uh, small air uh, controls and your, your, your skin senses that as an actual object. So they said that they could, these square things that they have, you could put it on walls, on a table, it was really impressive. This type of technology has been in use for a while with eye tracking. So another use and innovation to go with the VR goggles and headsets is knowing where people look. So you see this outline of this novice individual, this novice learner scanning all over this map all over this chart trying to find information and then you look at the expert that knows exactly where they're looking to find something it doesn't focus on anything else and they become much more effective and efficient 
Well, this isn't just a way of proving that you have a, a novice or an expert in front of you, or that you can better train the, the novice, you know, where to find things on a page. But could you also use this to affect systems and the human factors that go into it, where you have an electronic health record up in front of you, and you find out that the physicians are constantly flipping back and forth and they can't find the information that they're looking for, could you more effectively design that system to meet their need to find the information to deliver a safer healthcare system? So most of us have a really powerful toolkit that we work with, and we're innovators, and we can think outside the box and create things. But as you start to expand out your knowledge from all of these tools and talk with those around you at these conferences, your toolkit begins to look a little bit different. And you can be much more effective and innovative with how you approach solving these problems. Some of you are probably familiar with this book. It came out uh, in 2009 and sort of turned the medical industry a little bit on its head and put it out in the public spotlight yet again. But it showed that following checklist procedure and process in the operating room, and this was written by a surgeon, had significant decreases in errors, borrowing again from the airline industry. This is where that concept is kind of coming in. So by following a systematic process for how you move forward and how you proceed to deliver care is going to be able to easily affect what you're doing. Now, we don't want our learners to have their smartphones in the training environment, right? Why not? They're going to have it at the bedside. Wouldn't you want them to have that clinical aid there to practice with the way that they're going to be practicing in real clinical practice? Should we be discouraging that use? So Toyota is known for their 5S manufacturing. So they have everything sorted, that it's set in order, that it's shined and looks clean. Everything is standardized. So if you're at station one today or station 10 tomorrow, you won't even notice a difference because everything is set up the same way. And then there's a system to sustain it. How many people have their desk set up like this? Yeah, not me. <laughs> So this is what they're going after. Everything neat, orderly. You look over here, and if your wrench is missing, you don't have to count them and figure out how many you have. You know instantly that it's gone and which one it is. So I train emergency medicine residents in how to perform intubation. One of the scariest procedures in medical practice where you paralyze and remove the ability for a patient to breathe with the hope that over 99% of the time, you'll be able to get it back for them. In order to do that, they have to get equipment out of a cart about four to five feet away and bring it over to the bedside. And I have a checklist so that I just track to make sure that they're bringing everything over. I found that out of 36 residents, the majority of them forgot at least three items. Well, they just have to reach over and grab it again. It's not a big deal. You know, yes, it is a big deal when the person is paralyzed and not breathing and you forgot to bring something over. So why am I having this setup in clinical practice? I've seen the problem in the simulation lab and I've designed the simulation lab to look like clinical practice. So and I don't give them the checklist during the actual deliberate practice scenario. I want to see what they remember. I want to see how they're going to perform. Well, what if I gave them the answers, not just in the training environment, but what if I gave them the answers at the bedside? So I worked with an architect and designer to build an intubation board. This uh, board will slide under the mattress on the side of the bed, and instead of setting the laryngoscope and tube on the patient's chest, as they have always done, they now have a dedicated workspace 
at the bedside where they can reach without having to take their eyes off of the vocal cords. They can look down here and see which piece of equipment they forgot to bring over. There is a place to put the suction rather than under the bed on the other side where you can't remember if it's turned on. And in the bottom corner, there's a list of all of the medications, the doses based on weight, because in a crashing situation, your ability to calculate goes down. There's also a second number there as a check that will help you figure out if you have made an egregious error in your calculated dosings to give you a reference range. This was prototyped out, trialed in the sim lab, and then put into practice in the clinical environment. Shortly after having done this, I moved it back out of the simulation space while we could evaluate its effectiveness. I found residents going down to the cafeteria and getting trays and putting them under the side of the bed. <laughs> as as I that this was so helpful that they wanted to have it back in place instantly. Which brings us down to how we're educating now. And what is our goal in simulation education? This is the medical classroom that many of us still have in schools that we work at. And we just talk and teach. But is that really the goal? Are we going for education? We're going for mastery. We are trying to measure competence. We are trying to find somebody that is above and beyond just passing a test. So the difference between competency and mastery seems subtle until you start to understand what it actually means. It's not just your ability to pass a test. It's your ability to perform as expected every time without error. So, most of us think of education as looking like this. It's four years. I started, and I'll graduate. But is four years really the goal? No, I don't think so. And a lot of places are beginning to push that question. The American College of Graduate Medical Education in 1999 put out six core values that we were supposed to be training and assessing. Those include professionalism and our ability to uphold professional standards in terms of appearance, interaction, that we know how to behave and interact with different specialties, and that we have a self-understanding of what we need to be doing to advance the science of medicine in our delivery. Patient care, that we know how to, for any patient, deliver appropriate and effective care to that individual. The patient I had who was attacked by a swarm of bees. And every single one of those spots that you see is a bee stinger. This was not the isolated area, but it was their entire body. The medical textbook tells me that I'm supposed to get a card and sort of flick sideways so I don't squeeze the venom sac further into the patient. Patient care does not always get delivered the way the medical textbook expects it to, because that is not a practical application when the, the stinger is inside of the scalp and hairline. It does not allow for an area of skin this large that has so many stingers on it that you can't move the card. So knowing how to deliver effective patient care is important and knowing how to provide interprofessional and team communication as we train so that, again, multiple individuals and multiple systems are on a shared understanding of how they need to progress forward to deliver effective care. And then knowing how, at the end of a disaster, to step back, even in clinical practice, and say, could we have done anything better or differently in this case? What things did we do well? And how are we going to make improvements as a team next time? And we talked about it in our uh, introduction of how we affect system care across larger regions or uh, healthcare uh, sections. So, systems based practice 
just like this, is that it's no longer about one piece of it, but how all of those pieces work together. And that is where the SimLab is going to be headed in terms of educational delivery. It will be the interprofessional knowledge, the multi-system experience that will test and trial not just knowledge and education, but with practice and procedure for larger units. And of course, it will allow us to look at medical knowledge. But this is just one component of what it takes to be an effective clinician. So the way we delivered education changed June 29, 2007. Does anybody know what happened that day? The way that we all live our lives changed on that day. Imagine that you no longer had to wonder what the dose of epinephrine was. It was attached to your hand, it was in your pocket. So the way every clinician in practice is now using that device regularly on shift. And so I again find out why we've taken these devices out of the simulation lab. When I see my residents looking up something on Wikipedia, I want to know that that's their source so that I can direct them to something that might be a little bit better. I want to know where they are going for their information in a controlled environment where I can intervene and say, hey, I'm glad you're looking stuff up. Well, have you considered using this or this? Or do you know about these sites? This is part of the education. is not just that you know the knowledge, but you know how to find the knowledge. And every single one of them is now finding the knowledge on their own, whether they have the correct guidance with it or not. So classroom teaching has changed, and we can capitalize on this. We can use all of these educational tools to help with the delivery of care. So social media can be a way of passing on information quickly and effectively, but educate your residents, educate your nurses, Educate your pharmacists on what those new practices are and whether they are effective. They need to know how to go back to primary resources and primary literature to understand the 140 character snippet that got put out about this new innovation and new treatment that was actually only applicable for this patient population in this region with this subcondition. That information gets lost. But these larger groups have really effective methods of delivering fun, entertaining, and very educational content in the form of podcasts, blogs, and there are sites that will allow rapid searching and open source access to good medical information. And we can help show our learners how to find that and use it. YouTube videos can be an effective way of giving pre-information to learners so that they come in and rather than spending the classroom time learning how to do the procedure, they walk in and that valuable sim lab space is no longer a classroom, but just a care facility where they begin practicing the moment they walk in the door. So this was a question that came up again Virtual reality, has it already become ubiquitous? Does everybody already use it and consume it? So what you see here are three individuals that are about to apply for an emergency medicine residency position at our program. And upon walking into the door, they were informed that even though they had never met before, that they would now be working in a team together. One of them would be wearing a virtual reality headset, and the other two of them were handed a manual that gave instructions on how to defuse a bomb. <laughs> the person wearing the headset will be defusing that bomb, and is the only one able to see anything on it. They are now having to communicate with one another in a stressful environment, under a time pressure, with people they may never have met, and have to clarify, give readback communication and closed loop uh, interactions to effectively diffuse that bomb. 
I am no longer testing their ability to read an EKG when they walk in the door, which I consider to be inherent core medical knowledge that I can teach. But I cannot teach social skills communication effectively in the time that they are with us. So we have now used this for two years and will be continuing to do so as an integral part of our application process for medical residency. And I know that they have not all already begun using this in a large way. It's approximately 1% of them had ever put on a VR headset, even whether it was a demonstration walking through a mall. So is this what our classrooms look like? Yeah. So let's figure out how we can change that around. If they're going to be using a device in the classroom, just as many of you have phones, computers, I'm not going to tell you to put it away, but I'm going to figure out how to get you to use that to engage, sorry, to engage more with what's happening in front of you. Using software, pull everywhere, have them go and reference sites while I'm talking, open up a discussion with another college down the street that's having the same lecture and share ideas back and forth between those presenters. Open up live streaming so that your presentation is now seen by hundreds of other sites and you get not just local, but regional or even national input on how you're delivering care at your facility. This can be extended into the simulation lab. We have audio video systems that are ubiquitous and amazingly powerful. And most of us stream them as far as 10 feet away to the next debriefing room. How many of you would like to see the way that simulation is actually delivered at another center? <coughs> Why not open that up and share it and get feedback from educators at other sites about how you effectively or could improve the care that you're demonstrating in your simulation lab? So in 2015, there's a group that looks at higher educational trends and technology, and they began to think, about where some of this technology was going in the future. These are just some of the quick highlights. But they thought that the bring your own device and flipped classroom learning activities would begin to take shape in the next year or less. How many of you have already started seeing some of this at your institutions? It's not ubiquitous yet, but you do see that it is taking shape. Two to three years, they saw that maker spaces and wearable technology would be taking off in a, in a big way. How many of you are aware or have access to a maker space that you know about? Okay, again, it's beginning to become readily available to the masses. And who here has or knows somebody with a wearable technology device? So those have even been used, and I've seen it written in journals, in the treatment of medical conditions. A woman walked in with palpitations, a rapid heart rate, and they diagnosed atrial fibrillation. They noticed that she was wearing a Fitbit and were able to identify that eight hours previously was when her heart rate changed. They were effectively able to treat that much more rapidly because they knew when the rate had changed and knew they didn't have to worry about clot formation. So if you understand what the technology does, you can actually begin to use it more effectively in your own lives. So here's where we might be going uh, based on the report this year, that there's already going to be some adaptive learning technologies that as you begin to take uh, tests or quizzes online, that it will begin to direct you to different content so that you're not just repeating the same basic stuff if you already know it, but it will figure out and train and test at a higher level as you advance forward so that we're again not testing how long you've been in school but what you've learned in school and are moving towards mastery content. <clears throat> Going forward um, in the next couple of years we'll be in, uh, getting more of the Internet of Things you saw with the Arduino boards that people are beginning to build devices that communicate rapidly across systems and spaces. And so we'll be able to build more effective training and detection tools for assessment inside of the simulation lab that will communicate together. And eventually, we'll be getting towards artificial intelligence, already beginning, beginning to appear in our home, mo almost more for entertainment purposes with Google's Home or Amazon's Alexa, 
but the ability to start to have artificial intelligence voice communication with a mannequin, with a patient, is going to be effective in terms of where we're going with our training in the future. We talked about this a little bit with how we're designing systems, but what if we started pulling more of this into the training environment? So technology-induced errors. So they found out that poorly designed uh, electronic health records actually pose a completely separate risk and available information may be hidden. They've just made a change at our institution. Right before I left two weeks ago, they found a way to get the pregnancy results back faster because they do them in triage. So I no longer have to wait for that result to be performed in the lab across the street. Except that they didn't tell everybody that they had changed it. And they moved it to three subsections of folders to get the result instead of having it display in the automated list of available lab results. I couldn't find the information I wanted. I didn't know that the test had been run because it didn't show in the same system. And I actually ended up repeating the test on about half of the patients because I couldn't find it. So just because it's new and innovative doesn't always make it better if it doesn't fit into the needs of the system. <coughs> Train it, watch it in practice, find out how it's going to impact the, those that are actually providing the care. So as we get uh, forward to changing the way we deliver training, this was brought up to me and I want to uh, just make sure that the group is aware of it to keep an eye out for it. So this Congress session was beginning to look at this bill which would remove any animal-based training procedures from the military and basically move towards an entirely simulation-based system. This would have huge ramifications for how this industry would progress forward in terms of the needs for educators, the need for technology specialists, and for how the public views and consumes, or sorry, how the public views the training of uh, healthcare personnel in the military. So coming just to the end to see how things have uh, actually impacted <coughs> study done um, at mobile learning devices and part of a flipped classroom activity using augmented reality and this sort of mixed mode training and found that those who were given the iPads and access to this as opposed to just textbook learning had higher scores and better uh, outcomes for this. And this project I learned about just recently at the Anaxal conference uh, last month. This group here, no affiliation with them, but I was blown away with what they were already able to deliver. Got a $20 million grant to begin building augmented reality, open source scenarios for use specifically for nursing programs. These QR codes were designed to be cut out and set at various places in the clinical environment in the simulation lab. So when you walk in and you ask the patient, how are you doing? You take your device and hold it up to the QR code and a video of that patient panting, gasping for breath with asthma appears in front of you. There are more than enough options for how to pursue both good and bad care involved with this. And when you want to deliver albuterol, you scan the albuterol QR code and it's automatically loaded into the scenario and you see them beginning the treatment. If you want to talk to the mother who's in the room, you scan the QR code for the mother and a video begins playing with the video of the mom's reaction to this. And you as the controller in the back have a separate set of QR codes to advance these frame by frame to give different interactions with each of these codes. They are hoping to have, I believe, 70 scenarios completed. They're only about halfway there, they said, but something that I thought you should be aware of to check out because this is the sort of thing that's going to drive and change the way that we deliver healthcare education. So I'm gonna conclude there and let everybody get on to their, their sessions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak with you this morning.